welcome to the FASLA webinar, Advocacy in Your Backyard, How Scientists Can Make a Difference. We will wait another minute or so because we still have people joining in. Uh, so please uh, turn up your audio if you need to, and we will get started in approximately one minute. Welcome everyone to the FASLAB webinar, Advocacy in Your Backyard, How Scientists Can Make a Difference. We're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, so we appreciate you joining us. We are going to cover a couple of different things uh, this afternoon in the hour that we have allotted. And we promised that there will be plenty of time for questions and answers as well too. We thought we would start with a brief introduction of FASLAB for those of you who are not familiar with us. Uh, we wanted to bring everyone up to speed on what's happening with the 2018 appropriations process. Uh, and then we will finish out the webinar with information about how scientists can take action over the next couple of weeks while Congress is home for their summer break. We also promised plenty of time for questions and answers. And we ask simply that you submit your questions in writing. We have all the lines on mute today to minimize any interference. You can submit a question at any time, and this next slide provides some quick instructions on how to do that. We will hold all questions until the end of the webinar, but if you do have a burning question now, we do encourage you to go ahead and submit that. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, FASAB is a federation of now 31 societies as of July 1, 2017. Collectively, we represent over 125,000 researchers. And advocacy is a very big part of the FASLAB mission. We work collaboratively with our FASLAB member societies on our advocacy goals, and we are pleased to be joined by a number of societies today. Uh, those of you who may be a member of, FASLA, of a FASLAB society might recognize this slide with all of our logos. We also encourage you that if you're not a member and you're interested in membership, to please go to our website and click on the society that meets with your interest or your discipline and urge you to please get active in your society when you have a moment. So Congress is in an interesting point right now. Um, the government is funded through September 30th, 2017 with what's known as fiscal year 2017 funding. Uh, but that will run out and Congress must make a decision about what to do with the 2018 budget and the fiscal year for the government begins on October 1, 2017. So over the last couple of months, um, the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, who are the ones responsible for making the decisions about funding, have been hard at work working on the preliminary bills uh, for 2018. Uh, the House Appropriations Committee has actually approved all of their bills. The Senate has approved about 50% of them. And there are 12 bills in total that must be passed by both the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, the full House and Senate, and then they can go on to the President for signature. The final outcome of the appropriations process right now is very uncertain, but not atypical. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the fiscal year ends on September 30th, 
and it's been several decades since Congress actually finished the budget bills on time. So we are looking at what will likely be another continuing resolution or temporary budget agreement that will have to be enacted by September 30th, otherwise the government will shut down. We don't know how long the continuing resolution will last, but right now what's being discussed is something relatively short term so that Congress could come to an agreement before the end of the year on the budget. Um, that being said, there are a number of issues that could get in the way of a speedy resolution to this issue. Um, the first one, and we'll talk about this a little bit more throughout the webinar, is a dire need to reach a, a bipartisan agreement to lift the discretionary spending caps. Since 2011, uh, Congress has been, and the federal agencies, under some very tight spending limits. Those spending limits have been adjusted upward twice now um, in the last four years, but we're at a point where the original uh, spending caps would go back into place for 2018 unless Congress votes to overturn them or adjust them or even get rid of them. In addition, uh, we, Congress must reach an agreement to raise the debt ceiling, which is the uh, U.S. government's borrowing limit of the amount of money that they can borrow. This is another decision that will also need to be made by September 30th because that's the date by which the U.S. Treasury is projected to run out of money to pay its bills. So things are going to heat up quite a bit in September. That being said, the preliminary decisions that have been made by the Appropriations Committees are a mixture of some good and some bad news. As I mentioned earlier, the House has actually finished preliminary work on all of their bills. You'll see there that they have recommended a $1.1 billion increase to the National Institutes of Health, raising the budget to $35.2 billion. Um, the rest of the agencies on the House side, a little bit of a mixed bag. NSF, unfortunately, was recommended for a cut of $133 million. Um, the Department of Energy Office of Science and the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, the primary competitively funded research program at the Department of Agriculture, were both recommended for no change in funding or same funding as 2017. And then a little bit of a bright spot for the VA research program that was proposed for a $16 million increase. On the Senate side, we don't know the proposed funding level yet for NIH, but we expect to see that most likely the first week in September right after Labor Day when Congress comes back from recess. We are hearing that Chairman Roy Blunt of the committee that funds NIH is looking to provide another $2 billion for NIH if he can find the money. He's very much aware that the House has recommended a $1.1 billion increase and has said that he wants to do even better than that. Um, again, Senate recommended a small cut to NSF um, and increases for the VA Research and Department of Energy Office of Science. Um, these numbers, I want to stress, are preliminary and could change if Congress is able to reach an agreement to raise the spending caps. And in fact, the cut proposed for NSF really is a reflection of the fact that the bill that funds NSF also funds the Department of Justice and NASA, and there just wasn't enough money to go around. Why scientists should take action? Uh, I think you're on this webinar, so you probably have a, a good sense of where things stand, um, and we welcome your, your participation. Um, Congress actually is working towards a budget deal for 2018 that would raise those spending caps I mentioned earlier. I want to emphasize that if they do not get a deal, we are actually looking at real cuts to the federal agencies. Um, it, even if Congress put together a continuing resolution in September that would flat fund or keep everything at the 2017 funding level, that isn't the case because the 2018 budget cap actually is, is lower than 2017. So even a continuing resolution would require some minor spending cuts, at least for the first couple of months of the new fiscal year, and long term if they don't adjust those caps upwards. Um, in terms of a numbers situation, um, the total overall cap for 2018 is about $5 billion below 2017. Uh, $3 billion of that comes from the non-defense part of the budget, so all the agencies that fund scientific research. Um, so without a deal, things are not looking very good. Uh, the good news is that there is a lot of strong bipartisan support in Congress right now for the research agencies. Um, earlier in March, uh, almost half of the members of the House of Representatives signed a letter standing up for and saying they would support a $2 billion increase for NIH in 2018. And 162 members of the House signed a letter in March requesting a $600 million increase for NSF. And there were similar Senate letters that were circulated as well, also signed by both Republicans and Democrats. Um, we are still surprisingly running into members of Congress 
who don't know or are not really aware of how much federal funding benefits their state and their district. And if this were explained to them, I think you would find even more support for the research agencies. And I think as we're seeing around the country these days, voters really are having a greater impact on members of Congress. Um, they're listening to their constituents. If that isn't enough to convince you to take action, I also brought some data to the table, since I'm sure there are many scientists on, the, on this webinar today. Uh, the Congressional Management Foundation, a nonprofit organization here in Washington that works to bridge the gap um, in communications between Congress and the public and, and advocacy organizations like FASA, has done a lot of survey data of congressional staff. And what they found is that about 88% of staff said that even if they just receive an email from a constituent, it has some or a lot of influence on members of Congress. Um, social media continues to be another way to really influence members of Congress. Uh, and we know that uh, this, about 78% of folks say that social media posts have a big goal. 45% uh, also said that as few as 30 comments about a specific issue on social media are enough to gain attention from members of Congress. And we actually found that to be quite interesting that it would only take 30 comments um, to, to really raise some level of awareness. Um, and 50% said social media makes members of Congress more accountable to their constituents. So FASA, we will be talking about this in later on in the webinar about how you can use social media to be influential with your elected officials. All right. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So before we get into the specifics of actions you can take um, in the near term, I just want to talk in very general terms at the moment about uh, the goals of our current advocacy efforts. Uh, first, as Jennifer already alluded to in the short term, we really uh, the goal here is to inform your elected officials uh, about biological and biomedical research happening in their states and districts. Uh, it really is quite surprising uh, how many members of Congress still might not be aware that there's a college or university or the research institution uh, close to home doing this important work. Uh, and again, as, as Jennifer already mentioned, uh, we really are in the, in the near term trying to encourage members of Congress to support a budget deal that will allow for robust increases in scientific funding for the NIH, NSF, uh, and the other research agencies. Uh, again, if no deal is reached, uh, and the current law remains in place, um, all of these agencies are slated for a fairly significant cuts. So we really want to avoid that, uh, if at all possible. Um, in the longer term, uh, one of the main uh, sort of foci of our efforts, or one of the main, uh, is to help you to develop working relationships with your elected officials. Um, uh, this will help them to understand the broad importance of biomedical research uh, to our nation. Uh, and if I could use a, a cliche, uh, we like to say that advocacy is really not, not a sprint, it's a marathon. So it's, it's a process of developing these relationships uh, over the longer term, which will both uh, allow you to have your voice heard uh, in the halls of Congress, but also help your elected officials uh, to become champions for a biological and biomedical research. So uh, how can you specifically take action? Well, there are many ways to do so. Uh, the probably the the one that requires the least uh, time and effort is simply to make a phone call, call your elected representatives, and let them know why research in biology and biomedicine are so important. Um, you can also use social media to connect with your elected officials, and I'll say a little bit more uh, about that in, in a few moments. Um, you can attend a town hall meeting. Uh, these obviously have gotten a lot of press lately because of the somewhat contentious political times we're living in, but but these really are events that are that showcase democracy in action. These are. Uh, public forums in which you can go uh, and, and make your voice heard and talk about talk to your elected uh, officials as to, and, and explain to them why uh, science and biomedical research are so important. Uh, certain, the, the, one of the main thrusts of, of holding this webinar now is we really want to encourage you to meet your representatives and senators when they are back home. That's why this is bolded on this slide. So um, uh, how do you meet your, well, your uh, officials locally? Well, uh, our, I'll get into the specifics in a moment, but our website includes uh, information about connecting to your senators and representatives at their state and district offices. Um, these offices uh, are all across the country in every, every state and every district. Um, they're staffed full time, so you can set up meetings with staff in those local offices at any time. Uh, and they're also a channel of communication. So when you get in touch with those offices, you can ask about public appearances, uh, constituent coffees, various um, public events in which uh, your elected representatives are in attendance and when you can meet them and, um, and talk to them about science. So we are in the midst of a, a current recess. The current congressional recess officially started August 1st and goes till September 4th. Um, I should say that the House has already, uh, has already gone home, is already on recess, 
Uh, the Senate is, uh, was originally scheduled to be on recess already, but is, uh, because of events here in Washington, is expected to wrap up this Friday, so all the senators are supposed to be uh, going home by the end of the week. So for the next few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, resources that we have available on our website. If you go to www.faseb.org, um, you'll be able to find uh, all of this at, at your convenience. Um, under our uh, Science Policy and Advocacy link, there is uh, a Become an Advocate tab, which we have uh, highlighted uh, on this slide. And this, uh, this information, we really have a wealth of information here that you can use uh, to get in touch with your, your senators and your representatives to, uh, to make your voice, voice heard. Uh, one of the uh, nifty tools that we have is a, is a web form that allows you to find uh, your elected officials. So if you, uh, again, if you go to the advocacy, uh, to, uh, become an advocate uh, link, you can, uh, you'll, uh, you can find this website here. It allows you to enter your, your zip code. Uh, sometimes uh, entering your zip code is, is not quite enough because uh, some uh, uh, congressional districts actually split zip codes, so it might ask you for a little bit more information. But as soon as you put in your, your information and, and click the search tab, uh, you'll get uh, information will pop up. So um, uh, after you've um, uh, searched, uh, you should get a, an output that looks something like this. It's just an example of Representative Tom Cole, who's the chairman of the uh, subcommittee that oversees the funding for the NIH. Uh, and I just want to point out that uh, this, this website is very nice because it not only provides information uh, about their, your representative senators, contact information here in Washington, but also the uh, addresses of their, of their local offices. Um, so this is really the, the probably the easiest and best way to figure out not only where your local office is, but also find phone number and any other uh, contact information that you might need in order to set up a meeting. So how do you go about uh, requesting a meeting? Well, again, we have a whole host of information on our website that will uh, help you to do this. Uh, we have um, uh, not only uh, general information about how to get in touch with your, your local offices, but we also have even a sample email uh, you, can, you can use as a form. You can just fill in your specific information uh, and send that along. Uh, and in the coming days, we're actually going to be adding a new section to this uh, portion of our website uh, with tips on how to follow up on a meeting request. So sometimes when you send your first email or make that first call, it can be difficult to get in touch with your local office because, after all, um, these people are, are, are very busy. Uh, and so we have some, we're going to provide some additional information about how you might follow up to make sure you get a meeting scheduled uh, in the coming weeks. Once you have um, your meeting scheduled, we also have a whole bunch of information about uh, how to prepare and conduct your meeting. Uh, we call this advocacy best practices. And I just want to go into a little bit more detail about how this works. So uh, some of you may not have come to Washington or met with your elected representatives and, and senators before, uh, so I just want to go into some detail about how these meetings are conducted. The first and foremost, I should say that um, for those of you who might be nervous or, or a bit anxious about meeting with your elected officials, uh, I want to say that, that these meetings are generally uh, very cordial, very friendly, and, and can even be uh, fun and, and really quite rewarding. Um, these people, after all, are professionals, and they, they actually do enjoy hearing from constituents. So uh, when you sit down in an office, typically with a staff member, even if it's a member of Congress who may not seem to be from their, or their public persona particularly supportive of science or biomedical research, um, these conversations, again, are generally very, very cordial, very friendly, and you'll, you'll generally find a very receptive audience. So with that in mind, it is important to, uh, to be prepared uh, to know what is your ask. That is, what specifically would you like uh, the member of Congress to do? Uh, and in, in, in doing that, you want to determine if your legislator has uh, any relevant committee assignments or appointments, for example, on appropriations uh, or the budget committee. These are the committees that oversee things like the, the budgets of the science agencies. Um, we also encourage you to uh, do your homework. Uh, check the members' websites, uh, how they vote on congress.gov, and also look at their own websites and social media uh, sites to learn about their positions on relevant issues. It's important that you uh, gather relevant materials for your meeting, um, particularly anything you want to leave behind with congressional staffers, uh, such as FAFSA issue briefs and fact sheets, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those resources in a few moments. Uh, and then uh, last and certainly not least, after your meeting, it's important to, to stay in touch. You want to follow up your visit with an email thanking the member of Congress uh, or their staffer for their time and briefly summarize the uh, major issues that you discussed, including uh, your ask. Um, you want to keep in touch with your legislative uh, legislator through occasional correspondence and visits to the local office. Again, uh, people are very busy and it's important that they are continuously reminded about why these issues are important. 
Um, and in, if in the course of your conversation, say, with a, with a, a staffer, uh, they ask you for information or you, you uh, suggest a follow-up, uh, be sure that you do, in fact, follow up. Oftentimes, um, people are juggling uh, many different issues. They might not be up on, on, on all the information. Uh, and if you say, um, I'll get back to you, uh, please do get back to them. They do collect this information, and, they, and this information is very useful for them to have. So um, more specifically about what we, we have available uh, freely on our website for you to use, um, we have, uh, again, many resources. Uh, one you may already be familiar with are our state and district fact sheets. This is, these are um, uh, PDFs with information about science funding for um, all 50 states and for, for most uh, congressional districts across the country. And they, they look like this. Again, these can be found um, on our website for you to, to print, print or to, to use in, in digital form. We also have um, a wealth of other federal funding data available on our website, including trends in NIH research funding. Uh, we also have a new slide deck called The Value of Federally Funded Research. It's a whole PowerPoint presentation about why investments in biomedical research are so important. Uh, and we're also very excited about uh, a new fact sheet specifically about the National Science Foundation. Um, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, um, the National Science Foundation uh, has not really uh, received the same kinds of large increases that NIH and some of the other science agencies have enjoyed in the last few years. And so, uh, again, as our, as our advocacy efforts uh, evolve, we're trying to, um, to, to push more information out there by why NSF is also uh, a key funding agency. So this fact sheet not only includes general information about NSF, but also some specific reasons why uh, NSF is important for, um, for research in the biological sciences. Um, another uh, aspect of our advocacy efforts we, we would like to highlight is we would strongly encourage you to invite your elected officials to visit your lab. Um, this, is, this is really a wonderful experience. Um, this is a way for them to see firsthand uh, the important research that's happening so close to home. Again, some of them may not be aware of what's happening uh, in, their, in their districts or in their states. Uh, again, this also helps uh, you to build a personal relationship with uh, congressional offices. Uh, and again, one of the longer term goals here is to really cultivate champions in Congress for science and, and showing them firsthand the science is going on, why it's interesting, why it's important, helps your members of Congress to be better advocates here in Washington. And uh, again, last but not least, uh, is a way of simply introducing members of Congress to real scientists. Um, it's often uh, mentioned in, in, in sort of public polls and uh, from in other areas that um, a lot of people simply have never met a, a practicing scientist, and that includes members members of Congress. Um, when it comes to the logistics of uh, scheduling a visit to your lab, uh, next week we're going to be posting some new resources on our website specifically about how to how to set these up. So I'll look forward to the, that in the uh, in the coming days. Um, we also encourage you to use social media. This is a, a list of uh, tweets that we've put together uh, specifically about the current um, funding situation, uh, encouraging members of Congress to uh, increase funding for the NIH and the other agencies and uh, come to a budget deal that will allow that funding to, to happen. Um, these tweets listed on this slide are specifically for the August recess, um, but we have, again, on our website a whole uh, host of information about social media, and we encourage you to connect with us uh, at FACETOPA is our, our Twitter handle. Um, in addition to social media, we also uh, encourage uh, any of you who are interested in using traditional media. We've had uh, quite a bit of success recently. Um, many members of the FACET board uh, and other members of FACET societies have been submitting letters and op-eds to their local newspapers. Um, this is, again, a really good way uh, in a slightly longer format to discuss why uh, biology and biomedicine are so important to our nation and also talk about on a local level uh, how these things are benefiting communities across the country. Um, one just quick tip about submitting a letter or op-ed, um, uh, pretty much all um, newspapers have a format and length uh, requirements for op-eds, usually in the vicinity of uh, 500 to 750 words. So if you're interested in submitting an op-ed, um, we encourage you to get in touch with us. Our communications team would be happy to help you. Um, but also, please keep in mind the, uh, the guidelines of the, of the publication to which you are submitting. I uh, just want to highlight uh, a few other tools to stay engaged. Uh, please sign up to receive our FACET e-action alerts. These are email notifications that we send out periodically if there are particularly pressing or, or time-sensitive uh, events happening here in Washington, for example, votes on, on the budget. This is a very quick way to, to get engaged and to tell Congress to, uh, to take action and to support science. Um, we also uh, would love for you to subscribe to our bi-weekly Washington Update newsletter. This is a, 
uh, a wonderful briefing on, on various policy issues happening here in Washington, not just on the congressional side, but also actions coming out of the agencies on all a host of different issues that affect biological and biomedical research. Um, and please do follow us on Facebook. We are continuously uh, expanding our social media presence. And again, this is another way uh, in which you can uh, find out what's happening here in Washington and find out how to take action. And also would love to invite folks, um, as you do engage in advocacy over the next couple of weeks, please tweet at us and put, on, put comments on our Facebook page. What we would love to do is try and capture as much of the activity that's going on across the country. So if you do have a meeting with your member of Congress or a staff person, or go to a town hall meeting, please let us know on, on Facebook and Twitter. As promised, uh, we are now going to switch to the portion of the webinar where we focus on questions uh, submitted by audience and participants. So we will go ahead and tackle these, and my colleague and I, Ben, are going to tag team here. So we'll start with one of the first ones that came in. How likely is it that Congress might overturn the spending limits that came into place? I would say, and I'll let my colleague Ben jump in here as well too, uh, we've got a good chance. Uh, since the spending caps were enacted into law in 2011, Congress has actually busted through them uh, two times uh, for a total of four years. The only year they actually ever lived with the numbers that they had predetermined was in 2013, and that required some very significant and painful spending cuts that nobody liked and, and, and felt were, were worthy. Uh, I think, interestingly, this year, um, while well, I mentioned earlier that there's about a $5 billion reduction in overall spending, of which $3 billion would come out of the non-defense agencies, the defense budget would have to be cut by approximately $2 billion, um, and that is unlikely to be very popular. I think we're also seeing a growing number of Republicans and Democrats across the House and Senate speaking up very publicly about the need to, to raise the budget cap. Ben? Yeah, I, I, I think um, one, one of the dynamics here, a lot of people are obviously uh, concerned given the fact that the government has, has changed <laughs> quite a bit since, uh, since uh, January of 2017. Um, but uh, without getting too, too deeply into the weeds of the, of the politics, uh, the way the current budget law is written, um, it places constraints on both, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, defense spending as well as non-defense spending. And the, the scientific agencies fall on the non-defense side of that, uh, that dichotomy. Um, many members of Congress, um, particularly uh, Republicans, are, are eager to see increases in defense spending, but they won't be able to do that unless there is some kind of amendment to the, the Budget Control Act, this law that's constraining overall spending. So uh, again, even though pol the political dynamics have changed quite a bit since uh, last year, this, this dynamic is actually um, remarkably similar in that um, uh, Republicans, many of them, want to increase defense spending, also perhaps have a few uh, non-defense programs they like. Democrats would like to see increases in the non-defense programs, including science. And so those negotiations really will have to happen um, uh, moving forward if, if any of these programs are going to see much increase. And while Ben and I aren't going to make any guesses or predictions on this webinar because it's too public, uh, one thing we do know is what will help get a budget deal is if we get constituents and scientists and members of the research community out into these congressional districts this summer to really make the case for an increase in, in the budget caps. Another question came in about will the slides be made available? Absolutely. Uh, an archived version of this webinar and the slides will be posted on the FAFSA website probably by tomorrow afternoon, so keep checking back on that one. Um, one question here. Uh, uh, we didn't emphasize leave behind uh, information for the meetings too much. How important are these uh, materials for your member of Congress meeting? Uh, I apologize uh, for not emphasizing that further. Um, they, in fact, are, I think, very important. Um, again, feel free to print out any information that we have on our website and bring it to your meetings, the state and district fact sheets, our new NSF fact sheet, any of the other information there. We have uh, many things available, uh, easily be printed in PDF format. Um, shouldn't have any problems with, with compatibility on different platforms or things like that. Um, it, it is actually really, really helpful to leave that information with your members of Congress. Um, again, staffers are the ones who are, who are the boots on the ground. They're the ones writing the bills. They're the ones uh, making a lot of the, the policy decisions that then are signed off by the members of Congress. So having that information at their fingertips is really useful to them and can really help in these uh, these sort of closed-door discussions about what happens with the budget and with other legislation. So please do do uh, feel free to bring that information to, to your meetings and, and leave it with, with your members of Congress. Another question, are there any concerns about all the negative chatter around immigration? That's a very interesting comment. Uh, at this point, we're not overly concerned about that, especially since 
we do have a set of talking points that are available on our website to help frame the research message. That being said, if you happen to work in a lab or university and you've got collaborators across the country and in other countries, feel free to mention that and talk about the kind of global nature of science and how science does require collaborations outside of borders. So I, I wouldn't be overly concerned about that. Um, if you do, however, have a meeting and you're asking questions and you're not sure how to answer them, by all means, feel free to reach out to FACWIB and we can help you work through that. Um, but so far, we have not been, we've not been encountering any questions or problems with this. Uh, one person on the webinar asks, um, um, is there any point to reaching out to representatives or senators who are vehemently opposed to any type of spending increases? Um, this is a, a question we get quite frequently. Sometimes you, you wonder if there, what the point might be to, to going into an office of someone who, who seems to be opposed to spending money on biomedical research. Um, I would say, uh, contrary to that intuition, it, it does make a difference. Um, first of all, I, I want to say in the big picture is that biological and biomedical research uh, to this day remains uh, very much a bipartisan issue. We've seen large increases. Um, in, in the NIH budget under, under Republican Congresses. Um, the, the current chairs in the Senate and the House of the Appropriations Subcommittee that oversee the NIH budget have both been, been pushing very hard for, for increases to NIH. So, um, so again, health and medicine are, are areas where there is uh, this consensus that basic research matters. And I think that, um, again, bringing that message to all members of Congress is, is really important. Um, the other uh, quick thing I just want to say on this point is that um, advocacy, in many respects, is, is an act of persuasion. Um, if we simply turn our backs on those members of Congress who don't seem to be interested in science or interested in biomedicine, uh, then that, that shrinks our, our pool of potential champions. Uh, and so it's, we've seen over time, um, actually, members of Congress do, uh, do change their views on science. They do change their views on biomedical research. And so bringing this message to them, this positive message about why it's important, how it helps their states, how it helps their districts, uh, how it helps the health of the nation, uh, really can have an effect. So, so even if it seems like uh, it may not be a friendly meeting going in, we, we really do strongly encourage you to, uh, to talk to your members of Congress regardless of their, their party affiliation or their ideology. We've also been asked to discuss any approaches for informing members of Congress about the role that NIH funding plays in starting biotech companies. This is a terrific question and a great line of a talking point that you could use in your meetings. Um, if you're familiar with how it works and you happen to work for a small biotech or for a spin-off company that was founded um, after a, a breakthrough at NIH, by all means tell the story of, what, of, of your experience and your company's experience. Um, if you work in a district where you work at the university but you collaborate with and, and deal day-to-day -day with individuals who work for biotech companies, um, you come and visit your labs and you work with, you can talk about that as well. So a simple explanation about how NIH funds the very basic research that then can be turned into commercial products like diagnostic tests or other things, um, how that, how those work together is a great way to talk to your members of Congress about this issue. Um, and you can also mention that the biotech industry is really, was created off of all the advances of research. Um, you know, it, it may not be commonly understood on Capitol Hill that the pharmaceutical companies and the biotech companies are not going to invest much in the basic research areas. They're going to want to commercialize something or create a new drug that can then wind up in the marketplace. So if you talk about the role of basic research and how that helps spin off and support biotechs, then you can tell the story that helps them understand the connection. Um, one questioner asks, um, is it typical that members of Congress have a similar level of aides in their district offices that they have in Washington? That is, is there likely to be a science, technology, and health staffer locally? Um, uh, Jennifer, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that the local offices are generally not as large as their offices here in Washington. Um, although that said, the Senate usually have a more extensive staff than um, members of the House because they're obviously serving a larger constituency. So. Uh, it may be the case that there is not someone specifically tasked with health or science issues. Well, if, if anything, health probably before science. But there may not be someone with specific expertise in this area in the local office. But I would say um, don't, don't let that discourage you. Um, all congressional staffers are juggling um, many different issues, even those based here in Washington. Uh, and so even if you encounter someone who is not well versed in these issues, again, this is an opportunity to to, to help them to become better versed in these issues and to bring information to them. Uh, and again, uh, just put it put it on the, the local office's radar. This is something constituents, uh, constituents care about. 
And when you, the best way to kind of make that connection, if you're not sure who to speak to, is just pick up the phone and call the local office, identify yourself as a constituent, and say, I'm, I'm calling to request a meeting with either the member of Congress or one of the aides to talk about funding for NIH research. Who is the best person to speak to? Um, every local congressional office will have at least one, if not more, uh, constituent services representatives. So you can always uh, ask for a meeting with a constituent services representative or someone who handles constituent concern and they can usually get you connected to the right people. Another tip is if you go to a town hall meeting, uh, most members of Congress will not go to town hall meetings by themselves. They'll be surrounded by aides who usually hover around them. So go to the front of the room um, and look and try and get the business card of the, either the district director or the local staff person who might be traveling with a member of Congress. And then you can follow up after the town hall meeting and request a meeting by emailing or calling that individual. Um, uh, another question that's come in, uh, there is an issue that's brewing that we did not discuss on the webinar, but happy to, to bring folks up to speed, and that is, what about stem cell research? Um, the House bi bill that funds NIH includes a provision that would uh, end all federal support for research involving fetal tissue. It's also possible that Congress may reinvigorate the debate over federal funding for stem cell research. Um, if you are well versed in these issues and are concerned about restrictions on funding for fetal tissue or stem cell research, by all means, you are welcome to have that conversation. Um, if you need talking points, we would just ask that you reach out to us uh, after the webinar. We don't have those on our website right now, um, but we are certainly happy to provide them on request if, if there's a particular individual um, who, who is well versed in this topic and wants to talk to a member of Congress about it, although it is not our primary message for, for August. Um, this is a question that is, uh, in some ways, the, the converse of a question we, we addressed earlier. Um, my state is deep blue, and from my previous advocacy experience, I know that both my senators and most of our representatives are very supportive of increasing funding for research. Uh, reaching out to them seems like a waste of time. What else can I do that would really make a difference? Um, again, this is a very good question. Um, some of you may, may feel that, if, again, if you're living in a district where someone is, is always voted consistently to support science, that it, it doesn't necessarily prove you to get in touch with them again. Uh, again, we would argue that uh, it, it, it always is worthwhile to get in touch with your members of Congress. Uh, first, again, uh, congressional offices and members of Congress are juggling many, many different issues. Uh, and in, in some ways, even, uh, those who have been supportive in the past are the ones we really want to want to reach out to frequently because it reminds them that this is uh, one of the issues that they have uh, they've supported in the past and to make sure they remain supporters. Um, again, in this, in the vein of cultivating champions, people really will be outspoken proponents of research. Um, again, if people will have positive voting records, that's great. But we really want people to do more than that, to be, encourage their colleagues to vote for increases to the science budget. So it's possible that you may have um, a representative or a senator who's sort of nominally supportive of these issues, but it isn't something that they consider a high priority. So again, part of our, our longer-term advocacy uh, effort is to uh, make sure that the, these issues are high priorities because they are so important uh, for, for people across the country. Uh, here's a question from someone who's clearly an experienced advocate who's reached out a lot to their members of Congress and the staff who work for their members of Congress to discuss issues not related to science. I'm aware that they keep track of who calls and on what topics they call about. If I request a meeting with a member of Congress, are they going to have that information about me as a constituent before I even get the meeting? Is it likely to cause them to not want to meet with me? Uh, as long as you are polite in your interactions with congressional offices and the staff that you speak with, that shouldn't be a way to hinder you or prevent you from getting a meeting to talk about scientific issues. It is true that most members of Congress um, do keep track of who's calling their offices. They have databases and, and ways of doing that, especially if you call or write in an email and you identify yourself as a constituent. Um, but it should not impact your ability to request a meeting with them on issues that are different from what you've already talked to them about. Uh, most members of Congress do want to hear from their constituents. They appreciate hearing from them about the different issues that concern them. And it's actually really a good practice to, when you reach out to or engage with a member of Congress or their staff, really only stick to one issue at a time. Um, there are aides who handle different portfolios, and you may call about farm issues, but the person that you're talking to handles education. So I do actively encourage to follow up and ask for a separate meeting to talk about scientific issues if, if you want to, and if you have the opportunity. Uh, 
uh, question that also came in earlier uh, that I didn't want to bypass is whether or not FAFSA has any resources that might help uh, lay out an economic argument for the return on investment coming from research. And that's a really great question because we do. <laughs> so those district and state federal funding fact sheets that my colleague Ben mentioned included um, on the NIH versions of those for the state fact sheets are a couple of blocks of text and data that talk about jobs in the state um, from both biotech and research perspectives. Um, in addition, other tools on our website really talk about the impact of research. And we're very excited because we've just finished a new PowerPoint presentation slide deck that you can easily download and give as a presentation um, in a classroom or a, uh, in a, to the Rotary Club, or just pull data and talking points from that slide deck to use in your meetings with your members of Congress. Um, we will have up on our website very soon some talking points um, and a link to that slide deck and how to use it, but we certainly encourage folks to sort of print that out and, and pull different information. Also wanted to mention that the slide deck is fully annotated with all resources and links to, um, to the, where the data comes from. So it's a very credible source of information that you can use. All right, so um, this is a, a, an interesting and very timely question. Um, today's Nature online paper on human embryonic CRISPR editing will likely reactivate the debate about human embryonic research. Uh, it did not use NIH or other federal funds. Um, but there is relevant policy uh, related to, uh, through the FDA and others with, re as it relates to the use uh, of humans um, uh, or human tissue um, uh, for this kind of biological research. Um, any advice about uh, being prepared for what may be a vigorous and controversial debate? Well, this is, uh, of course, a very new issue. Um, <laughs> this is uh, uh, very timely and hot off the presses. Um, we haven't yet heard um, a lot of news, uh, at least not from, from Capitol Hill. Um, I think the way that this is being reported in a lot of the media outlets is actually uh, quite positive and it would actually be helpful to our advocacy efforts. Um, many of them are, are emphasizing rightly uh, that the um, not only is the research being conducted using private funds, so there isn't some uh, issue of transgressing on federal law, um, but also uh, that this, the, the, the specific experiments being done uh, were done to correct uh, a very serious uh, congenital illness. Uh, and so, in other words, playing up the potential positive uh, biomedical research outcomes can come from this line of research. So um, I think the, the, the short answer here is we'll have to stay tuned uh, and, and uh, find out what uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and what Congress say in the coming days and weeks. But I think uh, given that it's a very basic research project uh, that was not federally funded and that has uh, potentially very positive ramifications for biomedicine um, is, is a good starting point. Uh, another participant has written in, if I write to a representative for a district other than my own, will my message be read? I'm really glad someone asked this question because I can then uh, give a great answer. Um, no. <laughs> we actively discourage you from writing to representatives from districts um, other than your own and senators other than your own state. Most of the congressional offices, particularly on the House side, have very sophisticated filters where if you do write to them, um, they'll look at your snail mail or email address and they will simply discard the message. Others, if you try and use their online forms to write to them, when you put your zip code in, will then prevent you from actually sending the message because you're not a constituent of that member of Congress. That being said, there is still something that you can do and that is to kind of deep, dig deep into your own contact list and figure out who you might know in that congressional district or that state who could write a letter or an email to express concern or to urge that member of Congress to be more supportive of science. Um, and so if you have a relative or a former collaborator or a former graduate student or postdoc from your lab who's moved on to a different state, I, I really do actively encourage you to reach out to your networks and say, hey, you know, there's an important debate going to happen in Washington in September about the budget. I've written to my members of Congress, but your members of Congress can be influential in this. Would you please write them. And then you can direct them to all the resources on the FAFSA website um, if they say, well, I've never written to my member of Congress. I wouldn't even know where to start. So we have pre-written things, um, letters and emails and things that you can send, phone scripts and that kind of thing. Um, on a very similar note, uh, one of you asked, what about reaching out to members in a district where I work but where I don't live? Will I have traction even if I'm not a constituent? Uh, again, this is a very good question. Um, and we've actually had some success scheduling meetings uh, based upon where you work as opposed to where you live. Um, even if you live just outside of a, a member of Congress's um, uh, district, 
Uh, the fact that you work there still can, can uh, mean that you can have a hearing with that member of Congress. Um, we encourage you when you're using our online tools to look up your members of Congress. If you uh, work in one zip code and live in another, try both zip codes and see if they're different, uh, different representatives and, and try to get in touch with both of them. Uh, also, I should say that um, we're encouraging you to reach out to the Senate as well, and those are, of course, um, those are statewide offices, and so even if you're um, not having as much luck getting in touch with um, a member of Congress who's uh, the district where, where you work, um, you, you still may have uh, more luck with the Senate office. In a similar vein, uh, interesting question just came in. At one time, certain members of Congress were known for talking only with constituents who they could be sure voted for them. Does that still happen today? I think the good news is, uh, as we've seen in the last couple of months, members of Congress are listening to all of their constituents, not just the ones that they think might have voted for them. Um, the recent de debate over the health care reform, repeal, and replace bill, I think, provides a terrific example of how when members uh, of the public and constituents reach out and contact those members of Congress and their senators that are supposed to represent them, they will get heard. Um, and you can change minds and hearts and, and really influence the outcome of things here in Washington. So um, I think at any point, we just encourage you to reach out. It's not appropriate, nor should you be asked who you voted for. So if you call a congressional office and someone says, okay, what's your name, what's your address, and who did you vote for? You don't have to ask, answer that last question. Um, and they won't look you up or anything in the database. Um, uh, they just want to know that you are a constituent and you have a relationship with that local area. Okay, uh, this is one, it's a, a comment uh, as opposed to a question, but it's, it's a very good comment um, about using personal stories as ammunition to try to influence uh, colleagues who may be, um, uh, to, to influence members of Congress. Um, indeed, one of the things we, we like to say is that we, we use both uh, data and stories. Both are important. Uh, on the data side, we talk about the budget numbers and the trends over time, but uh, stories are also important. Your personal stories as scientists about what you're working on why it's important, uh, and, um, and why it's interesting. And uh, again, bringing those stories even to uh, supportive offices, for example, if you know your member of Congress is, is, uh, is interested in research, simply bringing them up to date on what is happening in their districts can be yet uh, more, in, more ammunition for them and really bolstering the arguments uh, for biomedical research. And, and those are stories that they can bring to their colleagues on both sides of the aisle, um, again, to, to broaden the constituency and, and, and broaden support for biology and biomedicine. And I think it's really important that anytime you visit with a member of Congress or their staff, bring a personal story with you. Obviously, we encourage you to bring some scientific information as well, but one way to start off a meeting would be or could be to tell a personal story. Um, if you're working on a particular disease area and you have had a lot of contact with patients um, or caregivers or family members who are affected by that disease, you can share stories of, of your interactions with, with your patients and your family members. Um, if there's a particular area of science that interests you because you had a relative with a, a disease, you can also mention that as well, too. So please always use a personal story when you can. Okay. Uh, one question here. Uh, is there a chance that the White House might oppose a budget deal that increases discretionary spending? Um, again, it's, it's very difficult to be a prognosticator uh, in Washington, especially these days. Um, we are, again, hopeful, given the fact that uh, both sides of, of the aisle uh, want to see increases in spending, at least, uh, but perhaps in slightly different areas. Again, the fact that uh, many Republicans are calling for uh, raising the budget caps, particularly to increase spending on, on defense. Uh, the fact that um, the president has said, has stated his very strong desire to increase defense spending, um, and that coupled with the fact that members of Congress uh, in both parties uh, want to see uh, more money available for various programs. Uh, again, this, this provides uh, more force the argument that they can come to some kind of budget deal uh, that would be palatable to both parties and, and be signed into law. Um, uh, another questioner has written in, in regards to contacting members of Congress besides those that represent you, uh, what if you are writing as a representative of a nonprofit research institution that benefits the entire state? If you send a message using your work address, isn't there a, is there a likelihood it would still be read? Um, I would say that, uh, yes, um, one thing that I did, we probably should have pointed out earlier, which is that NIH funding goes to almost every single congressional district in the country, but there are a handful where there is no NIH funding. That being said, um, a university that's in a neighboring district may still employ people who live and work in the other district 
or who work for an arm of a nonprofit research institution elsewhere in the state. So in that case, always send messages to senators since they represent the entire state. And you can write a, a, a letter to your member of Congress and point out that while this money may benefit Oklahoma's 4th district, it also sprinkles down to or reaches out to Oklahoma's 12th district across the state because of cross collaborations and research or because the nonprofit research institution has offices in several places throughout the state. Um, so you can always talk about the local impact of these dollars, even if they don't land squarely in your congressional district. All right. Um, another comment just came in, which is uh, very interesting and very helpful. So uh, thank you for this. Um, regarding the CRISPR edit heart story, the research was conducted within the ethical guidance of the National Academies of Science, as quoted in the New York Times front page story. Also, as the case with most human embryonic stem cell uh, research, results are years, if not decades, from common practice, at least in the United States. The results reported yesterday are significant because they provide proof of concept, and the results were better than similar experiments in mice. Short answer, US research informs the world scientific community. It is a long game, and limited funding is short-sighted. Uh, I think that that, in a, in a short paragraph, is an excellent set of talking points uh, for, for a meeting. And, uh, and, and thank you for the commenter. Um, uh, for that, that very helpful information about the, the recent news on, on CRISPR-Cas9. Um, here's a good question. Uh, would a member of Congress actually be interested in visiting my lab? Well, I don't know for sure. I can say that if you don't invite them, then they will have a hard time expressing interest in visiting your lab. <laughs> so we really do encourage folks um, to, to reach out and, and invite members of Congress. Also invite their local staff. I will uh, say that trying to pin down a member of Congress to a specific date and time to come and visit your facility it could be very hard. It could take a while to get that done. So don't be discouraged. Um, by all means, go ahead and invite their local staff or their district director or their constituent services representative um, to come and visit your lab. And in fact, they may have a little bit more flexibility in their schedule. So um, just reach out and, and you know at least make the invitation and the offer, um, and then you'll probably be surprised by the result. But we do know that visits to labs and meeting with people who work in labs is a great way to really open a relationship with a congressional office. All right. Um, one question here. Um, my university has pretty strict rules about employees engaging in advocacy. What can I do to make sure I don't violate any of my employer's policies if I reach out to my member of Congress to encourage them to pass a budget uh, that increases research funding? Uh, this is a great question. Again, we, we certainly don't want you to trespass over any rules uh, or guidelines of your institutions. Um, perhaps the, the most helpful thing uh, that you could do is actually to get in touch with uh, your university's uh, government relations office. Many of you who work in research universities will have staff who uh, handle these issues, and I'm sure they could provide um, um, uh, more explicit guidance about what you can um, uh, or, or can't do um, uh, with regard to, to advocacy. But, um, but it's important to, again, uh, not, <laughs> not, not violate any rules uh, that your institution has, has set up. Um, but uh, in general, uh, you'll find that, that this kind of uh, very broad uh, advocacy for, for science funding, for the science budgets, um, is, um, is, is permissible. Another person has written in, uh, honestly, what's the most effective way to get a politician's attention? I've emailed my members of Congress in the past and rarely get a response. And when I do, the responses are meaningless or really to a completely different topic I didn't write to them about. Unfortunately, we do hear stories of this, and not every member of Congress um, has staff who are completely on top of things. So what I would say is keep it short and to the point uh, when you write to them or you, you make a phone call or you visit with them. Uh, stick to one topic. So in this case, perhaps, you know, why we need additional funding for NIH and NSF research. Um, if you bring resources with you, leave behind kits that are well-sourced with information and copies of things like our fact sheets. That establishes credibility and says that you're a serious constituent with an issue that you want to talk to them about. Um, and don't be discouraged if you do write to them and you get a letter that says, thank you for writing to me about the farm bill, and you didn't write to them about the farm bill. It's perfectly acceptable to forward that response to the office and say, I appreciate getting a response to, to my letter. I didn't write you about the farm bill. I would very much like to get a response to my question about your thoughts on funding for biomedical research um, and, and federal funding for the science agency. So don't be discouraged um, if that's the way. We are seeing more members of Congress engage with constituents on social media, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, so if you have something to say, please be polite, but it's certainly appropriate.
to post something on a member of Congress's Facebook page, particularly if they do a poll or a question, and we're seeing this more and more too, you know, what's your opinion on healthcare reform, or what do you think the top three budget priorities ought to be? By all means, respond to those if you get a question like that on Facebook or, or Twitter from your, your elected officials. Um, okay, uh, one of you asks, um, the university where I work doesn't get a lot of federal funding for research from any agency. How can I make the case to my senators and representatives that increasing the NIH budget would be, would be good uh, to my state? Um, well, this, this is a great question and again uh, points to uh, one of the resources that we uh, made available to all of you. Um, our state and district fact sheets um, answer this question very specifically. Again, we, this is information that we have uh, on our website. You can download PDFs for uh, every state in the nation as well as nearly every congressional district that says specifically how much money from each of these agencies goes to that, uh, that state or that district. Um, so if you happen to be at a smaller institution uh, or are unaware of the resources that are being uh, spent in your state or in your home district, uh, we, we strongly encourage you to, um, to download these fact sheets and, and bring them with you uh, to your meetings uh, or to mention them in any other forum to your member of Congress or their staff. We are coming to the end of the time on our webinar, but do have time for one or two more questions. We've got one that just came in. So last call for questions for those who are tuning in uh, from cyberspace. But the question that just came in is, uh, I've reached out to my members of Congress in the past and plan to do so again this summer, but what can I do to help inform nine scientists about what is going on in Washington with the budget process and how this might affect research funding? What are some of the best ways to reach the public? Again, we have information on the FAFSA website that you can turn to. The new slide deck on the benefits of biomedical research that I mentioned earlier is a great topic that you can use. If you are a postdoc and you have a postdoc advocacy monthly luncheon or a, a postdoc lunch and learn series, we encourage you to go ahead and give a presentation using those slides. Um, if you uh, are a member of a local Kiwanis or Rotary or membership club and you have a chance to speak up at a meeting on a particular topic or get on the agenda for a meeting, again, you could also ask to talk about the federal investment in research and how it benefits your local area. As my colleague Ben mentioned, uh, submitting an op-ed or a letter to the editor of your local newspaper is a great way to get the word out to the community. All members of Congress are reading their newspapers in their home states and districts, and with the changing way that newspapers are published these days and more and more content going online, we've actually found that it can be a little bit easier to get something published if you submit to the online version of the newspaper. Uh, final question uh, before we have to wrap up is, do you have a way to help people in the same state or district who are interested in advocacy to work together so that we might go and meet with our representatives as a larger group rather than individuals? Uh, we can certainly ha are happy to provide some, you know, troubleshooting and suggestions offline about how we can do that. We don't have a particular uh, facility or format to do that right now, but if you get in touch with us, we'd be more than happy to help you reach out to others. One thing you could also do is if you have some kind of an online email distribution list at your university, whether it's a listserv or a department newsletter, you could also put some feelers out there and say, I'm, you know, I, I'm going to put together a meeting with my senator. Does anyone want to, three or four people want to join me uh, in August? And, and we can help coordinate that as well, too. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. Um, just want to remind folks that if you have additional after action questions, you can submit them to us at communications at fatsub.org. Uh, we will also have the webinar uh, recording and the slides available on the FATSUB website probably by tomorrow afternoon. Um, those of you who registered for the webinar through our system will automatically get a follow up email from us that includes both the archive version of the recording as well as the slides, too. So thanks everyone for joining us and uh, we appreciate your interest and have a great day.